Hit to kill ballistic missile defense is the ultimate precision guidance challenge. Many elements of a defense must come together to achieve a long range intercept. One of the most important and difficult parts is known as mid course discrimination. After a ballistic missile launches, its engines burn hot and can be detected by infrared satellites. Outside the Earth's atmosphere, the missile engines burn out and it reaches its peak velocity. At this point, the missile's payload, a warhead, usually separates from the rest of the body. The warhead is also accompanied by the flying junk pile of debris created by launching a missile, as well as by decoys or other countermeasures designed to complicate the missile defense job. All of these objects move together through space as part of a threat cloud. So for a missile defense system to successfully destroy the warhead, its various sensors must first discriminate it from among the various other parts of the cloud. The key to successful discrimination is the sensor architecture. Sea and land-based radars provide one picture of the threat cloud. Lower frequency radars are able to track the threat cloud but have trouble distinguishing within it. Once cued, higher frequency or X-band radars provide much sharper images of the objects within the cloud. But radars are limited by their vantage point and by their technology. Multiple phenomenologies can provide a more complete rendering and classification. Air or space-based sensors provide still other perspectives with greater persistence, potentially allowing for birth-to-death tracking. And infrared sensors show not just objects but their heat signature, especially low-orbit satellites looking sideways, comparing the objects against the coldness of space. Currently, U.S. Homeland Missile Defense is dependent upon only terrestrial radars. This places a large burden on the sensor network and makes it harder to identify the objects. That in turn means that the defender has to engage more of the objects in the cloud so as not to miss the warhead, either by firing more interceptors or multiple kill vehicles atop a single one. After the interceptors are launched, they receive imagery of the threat cloud, which algorithms compare to a threat database to help pick which objects should be engaged. All this is fused with the kill vehicle's own observations using onboard sensors to make the final determination for intercept. Finally, they maneuver into position to collide with the several targets that could be a warhead. The discrimination challenge is hard, but not insurmountable. An efficient and robust discrimination system should include a mix of sensors with different technologies from different domains on land, sea, air, and space. January 17, Iraq time, marks an unrecognized milestone. The United States has been bombing that country almost continuously for a quarter of a century. What has the U.S. been trying to accomplish with all these air attacks? And what has been the effect? The air attacks have occurred in five phases. But to fully understand this history, we need to go back to the beginning of air power theory. The tactical use of air power sought to defeat enemy air attacks and to strike enemy ground forces. But the horror of World War I led some air power advocates to propose a new idea. Use air power strategically to strike at an enemy's economy, population, and political leadership, thereby winning wars without costly ground campaigns. The massive conventional air campaigns in World War II, in Korea, and in Vietnam produced many positive results. But they did not by themselves produce enemy surrender. When Desert Storm began, some in the Air Force hoped that new technologies would force Saddam to surrender from an air campaign alone. Others saw air power as part of a joint campaign working with ground and naval forces. And an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. Air attacks did make a major contribution to winning Desert Storm. But as was true of previous adversaries, Saddam did not surrender to air attacks alone. Iraqi civil society and Saddam's government proved to be highly resilient. After the war, Saddam used his own air power to suppress insurrections and stay in power. So the U.S. instituted no-fly zones in the north to protect the Kurds and in the south to protect the Shia. These were successful in protecting the threatened groups, but no-fly zones turned out to be major military operations. Maintaining them year after year required continuous suppression of Iraqi air defenses and periodic attacks on the Iraqi military. I take the fact that he... 
develops weapons of mass destruction. The U.S. launched a new wave of air attacks during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. These attacks looked a lot like those of 1991, with two changes. The first was attacking Iraqi leadership directly, called decapitation. The second was called shock and awe, hitting a society so hard and in so many ways that it becomes disoriented and collapses. Both failed. Saddam evaded attack, and although Iraqi society suffered, Saddam did not surrender. In other areas, air power again made major contributions. During the long Iraqi insurgency, air power played a useful but secondary role because insurgencies produced only a few and then very fleeting targets. Many air missions were taken over by UAVs. Their patience and precision matched the nature of counterinsurgency. Over the years, a conventional wisdom has arisen about the use of air power. Decapitation is hard to do, but can sometimes be successful if there is a small group of charismatic enemy leaders. Strategic air attack can cause a lot of destruction, but its ability to win wars on its own is unproven. Battlefield support can be very effective, but it needs a viable ground force, US, allied, or local, to win battles. In 2014, President Obama pledged to disrupt and ultimately destroy ISIS. To do this, the US appears to be using air power in all three ways. Results so far are again mixed. We've killed several ISIS leaders, but others have replaced them. We've killed a lot of enemy fighters, but so far ISIS has been able to replace them, though with some strain. We provided air support to the Iraqi and the local ground forces with some success, but the rollback of ISIS's territorial gains still has a long way to go. What will the next 25 years bring? Air attacks have become a central element of U.S. involvement in Iraq and the broader Middle East. When we are changing regimes, we attack governments and civil society. When we are suppressing terrorism, we attack individuals and cells. When we are supporting partner militaries, we provide close air support to their troops. So where our policy goes, there will go the air campaign. The divided Korean Peninsula remains one of the largest sources of uncertainty and potential conflict in a prosperous and growing Asia. Unification of Korea will be one of the biggest changes to the geopolitical landscape and is seen by the world as a dark tunnel. Opacity among regional powers creates confusion. Misunderstanding impedes smart planning. False assumptions could cause costly strategic blunders. But CSIS believes the potential for growth, prosperity and peace of a united Korea is immense. How can we maximize the social, humanitarian and economic returns of a unified Korea while avoiding conflict? Beyond Parallel is an unprecedented and comprehensive resource for bringing transparency to the many challenges and opportunities of Korean unification. Beyond Parallel investigates the broader implications of unification, but also the specific issues that Korea and the world face. These critical issues are explored through expert analysis, satellite imagery, and cutting-edge methods of data collection. Welcome to Beyond Parallel.
Protecting the homeland is regularly identified as the top priority of U.S. missile defense efforts. This mission is dependent upon a global network of sensors and interceptors, including the ground-based Mid-Course Defense System, or GMD. The formal prioritization of homeland missile defense, however, has not always been reflected in the budget. Today's ground-based interceptors, or GBIs, were originally designed in the 1990s and to some extent still use technology from that era. Today's system is able to defend the nation from certain long-range ballistic missile threats, such as from North Korea. As missile threats grow, however, today's defenses could be outmatched unless steps are taken to improve reliability and capacity. By the end of 2017, only 44 interceptors will be deployed between Alaska and California. The site at Fort Greeley, Alaska was designed to hold up to 100 interceptors. But reliability and capability are equally important as numbers. The Missile Defense Agency is currently developing the redesigned kill vehicle, drawing upon advances from other recent missile defense programs. Space-based sensors and improvements for tracking and discrimination will also help. The United States should also consider other solutions, such as directed energy, transportable GBIs, or an underlay of other interceptors for key areas. Entirely new types of threats to the homeland are also emerging, including cruise missiles and boost glide vehicles, which require different solutions. None of this is easy, but continued focus will be necessary to outpace these threats. I'm Christy Turlington Burns, founder and CEO of Every Mother Counts, and I'm a member of the CSIS Task Force on Women's and Family Health. I join this effort because I believe our country has a role to play in saving the lives of vulnerable women and children around the world. For the last 18 months, we have worked hard to build a vision for the United States to lead. We believe the moment is ripe for a new initiative to unlock the potential of adolescent girls. Too often, girls and young women in the developing world fall through the cracks, facing early marriage, unintended pregnancy, gender-based violence, and exploitation. But we know that when girls are healthy and educated, they become leaders. They contribute to their economies, have healthy families, and build stronger communities and countries. In turn, Americans benefit from a safer, more prosperous world. We believe that we have a cost-effective and forward-looking proposal that Americans of all stripes can support. Our plan builds on a record of long-standing global leadership by the United States. We would focus on 13 low-income countries with great need and existing investments in areas important to the health and well-being of women and girls. We would spearhead new goals in four areas, maternal and newborn health, family planning, nutrition, and vaccination against HPV to prevent cervical cancer. These are key services that are commonplace in the United States, ones that benefit women and girls in a major way. We have also focused on how to get things done, guided by the principles of efficiency, accountability, and partnership. We call for the leadership by the Secretary of State, USAID, and Country Missions as well as high-level diplomacy to ensure that the U.S. does not go it alone. We demonstrate the need for better data, new innovations, integration of services, and an expanded role for the private sector. And we note the importance of sustained financial backing from the U.S. and our key partners. We've put forth a bold agenda because it will take big ideas and new approaches to help millions of girls and women living in poverty to realize their true potential. It holds the promise of changing the world for the better, a signature achievement for the Trump administration and the United States. I hope that as a country, we can unite to make this vision a reality. Currently, India ranks 54th on the World Bank's Logistics Performance Index, more than 20 spots below manufacturing competitors like China and Malaysia. This is a major challenge for Modi's Make in India initiative. For example, 
India's truckers report that 15% to 25% of travel time is actually spent waiting at the heavily enforced state border checkpoints. They pay as much as $1.1 billion a year in bribes to state officials. The main problem is that India does not have a single national market. Its 29 states and seven union territories each have their own system of sales taxes. As a result, internal borders look more like international ones. The version of the goods and services tax sitting before parliament isn't perfect, but it will cut down on transit time for goods, paperwork for businesses, and could add one half of a percent to annual economic growth. A seamless national tax environment will help Indian commerce flow more quickly. Air power and military space systems have revolutionized the way the U.S. military operates, and the global economy increasingly depends on reliable and secure access to space systems. The Aerospace Security Project at CSIS examines the technological, budgetary, and policy issues affecting the air and space domains. Our research is focused in three areas. Space security examines the evolving military uses of space and how the lack of norms of behavior can affect escalation and deterrence. It explores how alternative architectures and new space capabilities can enhance the resilience of U.S. military space systems. Air Dominance and Long Range Strike looks at the future of air and missile forces in a more contested operating environment. It examines the role of stealth, unmanned systems, and autonomous systems, how these capabilities can be integrated to enable new operational concepts, and options for the air and ground-based legs of the nuclear triad. Commercial and civil space explores international partnerships in space, efforts to reduce the cost of launch, advances in commercial space technologies, and policy issues that affect civil and commercial space programs. The goal of the Aerospace Security Project is to provide innovative, insightful, and timely analysis to help educate and inform decision makers. As new opportunities, threats, and technologies emerge, smart policy decisions can ensure the United States continues to lead in the air and space domains. Welcome to the Aerospace Security Project. Hit to kill ballistic missile defense is the ultimate precision guidance challenge. Many elements of a defense must come together to achieve a long range intercept. One of the most important and difficult parts is known as mid course discrimination. After a ballistic missile launches, its engines burn hot and can be detected by infrared satellites. Outside the Earth's atmosphere, the missile engines burn out and it reaches its peak velocity. At this point, the missile's payload, a warhead, usually separates from the rest of the body. The warhead is also accompanied by the flying junk pile of debris created by launching a missile, as well as by decoys or other countermeasures designed to complicate the missile defense job. All of these objects move together through space as part of a threat cloud. So for a missile defense system to successfully destroy the warhead, its various sensors must first discriminate it from among the various other parts of the cloud. The key to successful discrimination is the sensor architecture. Sea and land-based radars provide one picture of the threat cloud. Lower frequency radars are able to track the threat cloud but have trouble distinguishing within it. Once cued, higher frequency or X-band radars provide much sharper images of the objects within the cloud. But radars are limited by their vantage point and by their technology. Multiple phenomenologies can provide a more complete rendering and classification. Air or space-based sensors provide still other perspectives with greater persistence, potentially allowing for birth-to-death tracking. And infrared sensors show not just objects but their heat signature, especially low-orbit satellites looking sideways, comparing the objects against the coldness of space. Currently, U.S. homeland missile defense is dependent upon only terrestrial radars. This places a large burden on the sensor network and makes it harder to identify the objects. That in turn means that the defender has to engage more of the objects in the cloud so as not to miss the warhead, either by firing more interceptors or multiple kill vehicles atop a single one. After the interceptors are launched, they receive imagery of the threat cloud, which algorithms compare to a threat database to help pick which objects should be engaged. All this is fused with the kill vehicle's own observations using onboard sensors to make the final determination for intercept. Finally, they maneuver into position to collide with the several targets that could be a warhead. The discrimination challenge is hard, but not insurmountable. 
An efficient and robust discrimination system should include a mix of sensors with different technologies from different domains on land, sea, air, and space. The Defense Acquisition System has given the United States military an unmatched technological advantage for over 70 years. Along with its legendary complexity, it's brought us the Abrams tanks, the nuclear aircraft carrier, the amphibious assault vehicle, and the B-2 bomber. Today it spends more than $300 billion a year, nearly three times as much as Amazon's annual worldwide sales. Over 150,000 people and almost 2,000 pages of rules are employed to make sure that money buys what the military needs. And much like Amazon, you can find just about anything in DoD shopping cart. How hard is it to buy all that? Exhibit A, this simple 500 element flow chart that explains how the defense acquisition system works. Let's take a closer look at that framework though. There are three fundamental elements for every acquisition, a need, an appropriation, and a contract. The requirements process defines the need, which is often called a statement of work. The budget process generates the funding, and the contracting process buys the product or service from industry. This structure holds equally for all things in DoD shopping cart, from the simplest to the most complex. For the simplest things, the process can be performed by one government professional in a few days with a requisition order or need government purchase card, or funding, and a bill of sale, or contract. For the most complex acquisitions, hundreds of people are involved in every step of the process over a period of decades. Let's apply this underlying structure to the Pentagon's most complex acquisition program, the Joint Strike Fighter, or F-35. First, the need. In 2000, the Air Force, Navy, and the Marine Corps produce a statement of work for the F-35 also known as an Operational Requirements Document. While there have been some important changes to the document, these basic requirements remain the standard against which the program is judged. Second, the contract. A year later, the DoD awarded Lockheed Martin a contract to develop the F-35 with three variants, one for each service. And while Lockheed has been awarded several F-35 related contracts, this initial contract remains in place to this day. Third, the funding. Since the decisive competition kicked off in 1997, Congress has provided 20 years of appropriations for the F-35. The estimated total budget is more than $1 trillion, which includes all the money necessary to develop, produce, and operate thousands of this aircraft for over 50 years. To date, however, only about 10% of that amount has actually been spent. In other words, the F-35 is only now moving past its initial stages. This three-part underlying structure gives us insight into what makes acquisition work better. As the F-35 illustrates, a well-understood requirement, a clear contract that aligns contractor and government interests, and a realistic budget are crucial building blocks to set early on in the process. Even as we seek new approaches to acquisition, these critical elements will continue to form the foundation of any successful acquisition system. Food and the way we eat has always been changing. From how it's grown, sourced, prepared, to the consequences on health and the ethics of what we eat. In the 20th century alone, we saw food in many different ways. And today, there are many new trends shaping what and how we eat. Six billion, seven, five, five planets. The age of electronics. This big data is an example of what money will generate money. Money. Subject to arrest. The 113th Congress. Food of the future will involve three major drivers. Availability access, and stability. Our current food production and efficiency gains sustainable. With more people, there needs to be more food. Growth of this order requires more arable land and better farming. Most importantly, it requires significantly more water. 
The effects of global climate change will further exacerbate today's water problems. With the presence of extreme weather, dry regions will be drier and wet regions will be wetter. Access to food is tied to wealth and location. We produce plenty of food on the planet, but not necessarily where we need it. While global hunger and poverty have declined, factors of access and utility still include food income, malnutrition, and obesity. With more people, there is more demand for finite resources. Food, water, and clean air. Food shortages, riots, and mass migration will lead to global instability. But there are opportunities for change to avoid this precipice. The world is witnessing incredible advances in food production technology. While these are in many ways considered cutting edge ideas, not all solutions require radical forward thinking. If the developing world would adopt farming practices that were in place 50 years ago in the developed world, yields would certainly improve. Also, there is a need for continued agricultural research with an emphasis on commercialization. In addition, sources of food such as jellyfish and insects are regular staples in societies that are considered to be underdeveloped, but will continue to find their way into the diets of the developed world. Distributing the food revolutions of today is a major factor in creating a more secure future. The key to ensuring food security lies in the lessons of the past, the people of the present, and the ideas of the future. China is rising. Its economy is now the second largest in the world. China is the world's largest trader, having surpassed the United States, and Chinese military capabilities are expanding. In just a few decades, China has moved from the periphery to the center of the international system. But what does that really mean for the world? In some ways, China is a developed country, yet in other ways, it is still developing. China's transformation is often misunderstood, and the future of Chinese power is uncertain. Power itself is a nebulous concept. Power can be relative, it can be absolute, it can be perceived and anticipated. So how can we decipher power? Through China Power, CSIS unpacks the complexity of China's rise by analyzing the key components of Chinese power. What are China's strengths? What are its weaknesses? Does China's rise present a threat or an opportunity? Or both? What questions are you asking? Join the conversation at chinapower.csis.org. The supercontinent of Eurasia is home to 60% of the global economy and two-thirds of humanity. It's been called the geographic pivot of history. For over four centuries, Eurasia's economic focus has been the maritime passages that surround it. But during ancient times, many of the world's most important trading routes ran overland. Today, regional powers are putting forward competing visions for reconnecting Asia. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CSIS and to our Maritime Security Dialogue. Um, it's my pleasure today to be doing the introduction for the event. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everyone of our basic safety precautions in our building. Um, we, as a convener, have a duty to let you know where the emergency exits are. The, of course, the glass doors behind you lead out to Rhode Island Avenue. Behind you, behind me, excuse me, you'll see two exits that lead uh, back into the alley behind our building. Should a fire alarm or something go off, I will be in the room with you and I will let you know which direction we'll, we'll head. Um, Maritime Security Dialogue uh, is a joint venture co-hosted by CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute. And we use this forum to highlight current thinking and future challenges facing the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. And our event today is the third Maritime Security Dialogue, excuse me, in 2017. We have more coming for you in the fall. So we appreciate you um, joining us here on the first day of August in, in Washington is normally a sleepy time. Um, but we know today's event will be 
very, a very lively engagement. We want to thank in particular both USNI and CSIS want to thank um, uh, Huntington Ingalls Industries and Lockheed Martin for their support of the Maritime Security Dialogue. This is what makes it possible for us to convene these events. Today we're having a discussion with Admiral Paul Zakunf, who is the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. For those of you who have been watching our uh, Maritime Security Dialogue over the years, you will know this is not his first, his first foray into MSD, and we really appreciate him coming back and keeping us um, up to date year in and year out uh, to, for what is happening inside the Coast Guard, his vision and leadership of the Coast Guard. Uh, and where we are going in um, uh, both uh, maritime security and other missions related to Coast Guard duties. Uh, as a reminder, um, Admiral Zakunf is the 25th Commandant of the Coast Guard. He is a native of Connecticut, and uh, as I have mentioned before in this forum, he served as the Federal On-Scene Coordinator for the Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, where he had to direct more than 47,000 responders, 6,500 vessels, and 120 aircraft in response to the largest oil spill in U.S. history. He has many other things that he has been engaged in, and I know from the backstage conversation that um, he and my co co cohort and companion in crime, Vice Admiral Pete Daly, will have much to discuss in the moderated session that follows. But before that, please join me in welcoming the Commandant for uh, his remarks. Kat, thank you, and uh, thanks to CSIS, uh, Vice Admiral Pete Daly, thanks to uh, U.S. Naval Institute, uh, and I want to thank those who took time to be here or who are here remotely as well. So in three days, the Coast Guard will celebrate its 227th anniversary. Uh, what was significant was back in 1790, we did not have a United States Navy. I don't use the term that we are the oldest continuous seagoing service, but sometimes I'm introduced that way. But what happened in 1790 is we were a bankrupt nation. You know, our war for independence bankrupted the nation and we could not afford a U.S. Navy. Uh, so under the vision of Alexander Hamilton, we created a Coast Guard so we can collect tariffs. It's also the birth date for U.S. Customs Service as well, because they collected those tariffs. Uh, I would like to say that since 1790, the Coast Guard and the Navy found itself funded on an equal level, but that is not the case today. <laughs> Uh, when I'm looking at a total appropriation of something just south of $11 billion that pays for everything, pay, retirements, new acquisitions, and then operating today. Uh, and so when I came to this job three years ago, we found ourselves in, in what I would call a slow decay. Uh, it was trying to recapitalize and bring on new assets at the same time we were offloading people. Uh, and I've seen other services pay that price. Uh, to recapitalize, you have to mortgage your workforce. And so when you start looking at you know, 10, 20 years down the road as you've done a recapitalization, who's going to operate, who's going to leverage and make best use of these new resources uh, that you're bringing on board? And what really hit home with me, I was only in the job for a week, and uh, the prior first sea lord, George Zabellis, approached me. He was in town. Um, and they were faced with a dilemma. They were going to have to tie up frigates because they didn't have the crews to man them. And the manning that they were lacking were skilled engineers. And it just so happened that their propulsion systems, auxiliary systems, nearly identical to the plants that we have in the United States Coast Guard. So how did the Royal Navy arrive at that point? Well, 15 years prior to that, a decision was made to cut costs, don't bring new people on board. Don't add to the payroll. And then when 15 years go by, you don't have those senior technicians in your fleet. And literally, they would have had to tie up their fleet. So we have sent 40 members of the Coast Guard and their families, and they serve full time in the Royal Navy. And we will do so for a period uh, of about six to seven years. Um, the Japan Coast Guard, when I meet with my, my commandant counterpart, is uh, recalling retirees if they will come back to serve in their fleet. With zero population growth and other opportunities, uh, are, are people wanting to serve in Japan Coast Guard? And the answer is they are struggling. So if you're going to recapitalize, don't mortgage your future, don't mortgage your, your people as you go along. Now, one area where the Coast Guard has struggled is it's great that we have 11 statutory missions. And we'd always name the last one 
military defense operations. And by doing so, if you're giving a sermon, you usually have three themes, and people are going to forget the 11th one because they've already tuned out after you've given the third theme to your sermon. Um, and yet we are a military service, and that really needs to be first and foremost. We have participated in every military campaign since 1790. Uh, every COCOM has Coast Guard in it. Coast Guard is deployed off all seven continents today. The J-6 in the Pentagon is a Coast Guard Vice Admiral. Twenty ships are chopped to DOD combatant commands as I speak today, 11 alone serving under SOUTHCOM. Uh, when our heavy icebreaker gets underway, it's deemed not to be a DOD asset, then why is it chopped to PACOM? I don't own that ship when it gets underway. So a big part of our Coast Guard is military, yet 4% of my less than 11 billion net budget, 4% is funded by defense discretionary spending. The other 96% comes from non-defense discretionary, which is how a Coast Guard finds itself doing more with less. And when you answer to 22 committees, and many of these are authorizing committees that say you shall do the following. And if they don't talk to the appropriators, then you find yourself doing more with less. You have to do these things by law, but you haven't been funded to do that. We're the only military service that finds itself in our operating expense um, in the basement of the Budget Control Act. Uh, my other service chief counterparts, they lament the day they ever see the floor. And as I'm sitting in the basement looking up at the floor, I'm here to say the view from the basement is not that pretty. It's like the New York Mets of 1962. You have no place to go but up, and we must go up. So what are we doing? I mean, how do you leverage this fifth armed service in the 21st century today? Uh, when I spoke at the International Sea Power Symposium in Newport, Rhode Island uh, last September, uh, I talked about some of the maritime threats that are facing us today. We talked about piracy, and there's a lot of that going on. When you have ungoverned territories, Piracy fills its void. It goes all the way back to the Barbary pirates uh, back in the late 1700s. Uh, we have the largest flow of refugees since World War II. Uh, we have illegal, unregulated, and underreported fishing when 3 billion people in the world subsist on fish today. And these fish stocks are non sustainable as we see our world population continuing to grow. And in fact, a lot of maritime conflicts today are among fishermen or among competing claims of who owns a 200-mile EEZ, uh, and also further contested claims over sovereign rights, the nine dash line, and also as I look at what is playing out in the Arctic, it looks eerily familiar to what we're seeing in the East South China Sea and with what Russia is doing up there as well. Uh, we're seeing the movement of transnational criminal organizations uh, who realize that we, most of our trade moves by water and they're using these same trade, trade routes to move people, to move weapons, bulk cash, and the like. So when I gave that talk before 108 uh, navies and Coast Guard in Newport, Rhode Island, for the next three days, all we talked about were Coast Guards. Um, and finally, it was the Indian Navy said, hey, uh, the CNO hosted this event. Can we go back to talking about their ballistic missile defense and traditional naval conflict, and so we did. But what it underscored is the fact that many of our maritime threats are, require unique authorities, require Coast Guard authorities, and many maritime nations, um, they certainly can't afford a Navy sea power like we have. And so they model themselves after the Coast Guard, but time and time again, they came up to me and said, we want to be like the United States Coast Guard. And so for years and years, we would always compare ourselves to the Navy. And you cannot compare, if you just look at the size of our service, how they're funded, the systems we operate, you know, it, it's not, an, it's not a, a fair comparison to make. Um, but if you compare ourselves to other Coast Guards that want to be like this Coast Guard, uh, we are the world's best Coast Guard. And over the last three years, I have been around the world several times now. Um, and time and time again, I hear more and more, we want to be like the United States Coast Guard. 26 international students at our Coast Guard Academy. So they can grow future generations of officers that understand maritime governance, uh, that understand the unique aspects of a Coast Guard in a very complex world today. 
where at the end of the day, I mean, trade needs to continue to flourish, but how do we isolate licit from illicit trade? And that doesn't happen unless we share information, share best practices, and many times they look to us to do just that. So I thought I'd use that as a primer, if you will, to uh, before we open it up to Q&A, and I want to turn it over to Pete Daly, and I think we'll go into a facilitated discussion, and then it'll open up to the floor to questions and answers. So again, thank you for being here on the first day of August. Thanks. Well, sir, uh, you started, uh, first, thank you for coming today, and you started uh, your remarks with the context of the Coast Guard, what the Coast Guard does, and then you wrapped up on the budget theme, so I thought I'd pick up right there. When the first uh, skinny budget that the administration came out with came out, it did not smile upon the Coast Guard. And uh, things have gotten a little better, but I'd like to ask you about making the case, the case you just talked to us about within the administration and with, with, on the Hill. And uh, the big one, the big one to me is the, the balance between soft power, the police authorities that you have, the law enforcement authorities, I should say, and, uh, and then the hard power contribution that you make as a military service. Is it the diversity of that? Is it the complexity of that? Like you said, 11, 11 major missions. How, how is it making that case and are, do you feel you're being successful now? Yeah. So when we went from 11 statutory missions to providing context in the 21st century, uh, the first thing I looked at was in 2014, uh, unprecedented flow of unaccompanied minors. In fact, those numbers are starting to creep up again. Uh, and as our Department of Homeland Security was looking at detention facilities and how do we place all these kids, uh, I was looking at, well, why did they leave in the first place? Um, so rather than study that from behind my desk in Washington, D.C., I went down and I met with the presidents in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Uh, and they said, we are a victim of our geography. Uh, we live just north of the largest cocaine-producing country in the world in Colombia. Um, and then to the north is the largest consuming country of cocaine in the world, the United States of America. And what is happening, and this was in my interaction with President Hernandez uh, down in Honduras, uh, he said, bulk shipments of drugs arrive. Um, and our economy cannot compete with the dollars that can be made by moving illicit drugs. Violent crime in 2014 was nearly 100 per 100,000 in Honduras, making it the most crime-ridden nation in the world. And how did it get there? The violent crime was a direct result of drugs coming into the country. So as a comment on the Coast Guard, I said, okay, well, we need to double down on this particular flow and stem this from coming into Honduras. So a year later, I checked in with President Honduras, and he said, how's it going? He said, well, our murder rate has dropped 40%. So what have you done? He goes, well, when you put up that sea shield, and I didn't use any such term, but we sealed off the Honduran rise. Drugs were not arriving. The cartels, they, they folded camp and they moved, well in this case they moved to Costa Rica. Um, drug flow went down precipitously. Um, and unfortunately it went up in Costa Rica as well, but we saw the direct correlation between drug shipment, violent crime, and why do parents put their life savings in the hands of a human smuggler? It's to get their children into a, a crime-free, relatively crime-free nation with an opportunity to prosper. Now the irony behind this is, you know, they're sending them to the drug-consuming country um, to leave their country that was been ravaged by drug flow, and they're nothing more than a thoroughfare between Colombia and the United States. So we wrote a strategy for that. Um, the White House has a strategy. We did a, something similar for the Arctic as well. Uh, we've got another one on cyber. Uh, and I've got a fleet of 35 ships, very old ships, that enable $4.6 trillion of maritime trade every year. Um, and people say we can't afford to recapitalize that fleet. I don't think we can afford to let $4.6 trillion slip out of our GDP. So we talk about soft power. Um, you know, a book I would commend to everybody is a book written by uh, Graham Allison. It's called uh, Thucydides' Trap. Um, and on the, uh, you know, the destiny to war, and this is with China. So over time, you know, if you go back to Thucydides, he wrote about the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, and you had a rising Athens, and Sparta didn't like that, so they went to war. 
Well, there have been 16 other occasions uh, where you've had rising powers, and in 12 of those 16, it resulted in war. So what does a rising China really mean to the United States? You know, what other tools of diplomacy do we have? We already have the economic piece in terms of a trade relationship. So today, uh, there is a Chinese shiprider on a Coast Guard cutter uh, operating off the coast of Japan. Uh, there are Coast Guard C-130s flying out of Japan. Uh, we're working with Russian Border Service, South Korea, Canada. But what we're enforcing is this illegal, unregulated, underreported fishing, illegal fishing in the Western Pacific. You can get countries that would not normally see eye to eye to rally around a maritime threat, an environmental threat, uh, an economic threat, um, and using Coast Guard authorities to do it. Just one example of how we're using soft power, but also engaging Russia, also engaging China. Uh, we're engaging Russia in the Arctic as well. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of catch up work to do in the Arctic as well. Well, you mentioned uh, several things and uh also the global partnership aspect of it. But if you just come back to the Western Hemisphere for a minute, obviously we have an administration that's very focused on border security. Some would, I would even use a stronger word, maybe they're obsessed with border security. But it's a, it, it's a strong focal point. Have you, you know, it just strikes me, the story you just told about El Salvador, Honduras, and, and meeting with the, the leaders of those countries, talking to them, about really the source of the problem, and it speaks to uh, defense in depth of, you know, do you really want to build the wall on your front yard, or do you want to deal with the problem where it's happening? And is that the only problem? Obviously, the Coast Guard has a huge responsibility for port security, and the volume that goes through those ports is immense. So have you been successful in making the case about uh, the fact that it's really not about one wall. So when I look at a defense in depth, now defense is great, but I played quarterback as a younger kid. And I like playing offense. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about what playing offense looks like. Um, we have awareness of, of over 80% of the illicit drug flow that is eventually destined for the United States. Um, it's dropped off in Central America and then it's smuggled up the isthmus. Um, and then eventually either through our border, commingled with licit trade, or under the border, or maybe in a boat around the border. Uh, but what's unique is we have 40 counter-drug bilateral agreements uh, where countries like Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, that don't have navies, that don't have the maritime resources, to say, will you police our waters? And by policing, I mean up to deadly force in their sovereign territorial seas to prevent these drugs from coming ashore. Because they know when we stop them, they're not going to pay a bribe. In fact, they're going to the Middle District of Florida for prosecution, and 585 smugglers were prosecuted last year in the United States, working with our Department of Justice, not just prosecuted. Now, they might get one or two years taken off a 14, 15 year term um, if they provide us information on where is this coming from and who is moving it so we can go after the you know, the center of gravity of, of some of these trafficking organizations, transnational criminal organizations. But you have authorities that extend way beyond the border. Um, and, and so that is the real value proposition, is that you can play offense, but you just can't have a defense. Um, the two must complement each other. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, for want of resources, um, the signal that we had last year when we were awarded uh, to build the first nine of a fleet of 25 uh, light frigates called an offshore patrol cutter. Uh, we awarded phase two uh, to build out all 58 fast response cutters. We had a ninth national security cutter added to our program of record when uh, four years ago uh, we were struggling to get four or five of these on budget and now we've doubled that as well. So the signal that we are seeing is we've got to invest in more resources. Now this is coming at a point in time where the national military strategy um, pulls the Navy in, in every direction around the globe, but not in the Western Hemisphere. So when the Perry class frigates were retired, um, I, I can't go to my dear friend, uh, John Richardson, and say, hey, we need more Navy when he's got more Navy in the East South China Sea. 
as we look at the dark cloud over North Korea right now, uh, and where the other fires that the Navy is putting out, how does the Coast Guard complement that? And so that is our role as we serve as a military service of how to integrate with, uh, but don't replicate what our Navy is doing elsewhere around the world. Yes, sir, you talked about, uh, you mentioned the combatant commanders and the fact you have to chop forces, even the icebreaker to them when they operate. And of course, the combatant commanders always fascinate me because they, they worry about today, they're riveted on regional requirements and their budget unconstrained. You are riveted on the future because the Coast Guard that we have in 15 years will be the Zukunft Coast Guard. You are budget constrained and uh, you've got uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of priorities to service. One of those priorities you mentioned was the workforce, that you, you mentioned that people have to sometimes mortgage their workforce to get something done. Where do you want to take the Coast Guard workforce? What should the Coast Guard workforce look like five, ten years from now? What are the skill sets you're emphasizing? How does it need to change uh, to meet the future? Um, so when I look at the new platforms that we're delivering right now, uh, and the, the next wave is, you know, a autonomous systems. Um, we are just, you know, we're probably, you know, for me, I believe we are a decade behind where this service needs to be uh, in, in operating autonomous, uh, especially in the ISR realm. Uh, I, I can request forces, but, you know, those are uh, you know, precious commodities right now when you look at what our ISR needs are around the world. And so maybe the Western Hemisphere or maybe the Arctic doesn't rack and stack high enough. So, so I need to invest in that as well. We need to invest in cyber. Um, I was just out in uh, uh, L.A., Long Beach, uh, Friday, uh, and I met with uh, the port director at APM Maersk uh, to find out what happened uh, earlier uh, at the end of June, um, which, which shut down Maersk shipping for four to five days. The cyber event. The cyber event. Um, and what concerns me there is we're seeing the number of shippers, especially in containerized shipping, consolidate. Uh, fewer of them. Um, and what if this was a, a coordinated event that would shut down multiple shippers? And uh, when I look in the rust belt, when I look at the manufacturing floors, they usually have about three to four days of inventory on hand. Uh, their warehouse is on a rail car. Um, and from there, it's on a container ship. Um, but that just-in-time inventory does not compensate for any disruption and any of that product moving from, from ship to shore uh, to ultimate destination. So real challenge there. Now the good news is Maersk notified us. They called our National Response Center uh, so we could activate our Area Maritime Security Committees about this threat that literally wipes your database clean. Um, it's not even ransomware. Uh, you know, what's the point of paying a ransom when all your data is lost anyway? You're gonna have to go out and recapitalize your entire IT system and Maersk was able to do just that. Um, but I would put Maersk in the responsible shipper. But they were able to share with us, and very discreetly, some of the vulnerabilities that we learned from. Um, but I would just uh, end that discussion there. But we need to be involved in that world of work. The new ships that we're building, very complex. Uh, upwards of two years of schooling to operate some of these systems on these national security cutters. So. You're coming back to sea again in the Coast Guard. Uh, yeah, you're going to do that ship tour. We'll put you on the beach servicing one of those ships, but we're going to need for you to come back a second time around to leverage the training that we have invested. Uh, and now everyone doesn't relish going to sea unless you're like me. Um, and you talk about the future. Uh, maybe you know Pete, but my name literally Super translates to future in German. So uh, yeah, maybe it's my prophecy. I, I don't know, but. The people piece, we have got to get this right. Um, as you look at more and more specialization in your workforce. Uh, and I was talking to John Hyten. Uh, he is Stratcom. Uh, and, and he was coming to work one day. And an airman, an E3, uh, drives up in his Tesla S series. And he has to ask the question, uh, how does an E3 afford a Tesla S series? And he goes, well, General, um, I'm a reservist. Um, and when I'm not a drilling reservist, I'm the security officer for a company called Google. That's how an airman can afford 
a Tesla S series. But I say that because if, if you ask any airman, any Marine, any sailor, soldier, or Coast Guardsman, they don't serve for a salary. I mean, they, they really serve our nation. I mean, this is the best armed service that I have seen in my four decades of wearing this uniform. And they want to serve. Uh, they want to be empowered. They don't want to be micromanaged. Uh, they want to go out and change the world. The worst thing I can do is stand in their way and give them the tools that they need to succeed. Good news is what we're recapitalizing, the, the old ships um, that are being replaced with new ships are a quantum leap in the right direction. I just can't get there fast enough. You know, one of the uh, things that comes up from time to time is with all the diversity of mission that you have that some people express concern occasionally uh, about the demise of the Cutterman, you know, that the, the going to sea aspect of the Coast Guard, which is core, can get lost in the other things that uh, you have to service as missions. Could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, you've already mentioned that it's more complex, stand by, you're gonna go back to sea, and that's, you, you'd be okay with that. But have you had to do some self-talk within the service about that important core of the seagoing aspect and the military aspect. So, so I talked about you know four strategies, and these are really regional, operational, Western Hemisphere, Arctic, uh, our maritime transportation system, the four point six trillion dollars, and in cyber. Well, there's a fifth one, uh, and this one has no end because it's going to continually evolve. But we, you know, a year and a half ago, I pushed out a human capital strategy of how do you recruit, how do you train and how do you retain a military workforce in the 21st century with all the other competing factors that are around us, an aging population, maybe more and better job opportunities in the civil sector. How do you keep these folks in the service? And we've gone out, we've done a number of listening sessions. And one of the number one dissatisfiers are the number of times you move in a military career. Now I've moved 21 times in 40 years. That's probably insane. Um, but if you start looking at ship to shore rotations, and one reason why we want to cluster where we home port our ships, because we also build the bases to support those platforms. So when you leave sea duty, you go to a base. You don't tell the family, you don't tell your spouse, okay, you may not have a job where we're moving to. Kids, sorry, you're going to a different school. But if we can do fewer moves, and especially in our seagoing community, where folks can really home port in a location for multiple tours, and the first thing we've done is removed any stigma whatsoever uh, associated with geographic stability. Uh, we used to frown on that. Um, now I embrace it. Uh, it does three things for us. Uh, the first thing it does is you have people familiar with the platform, the area of operations, and so it's good for readiness. Um, the next thing, it saves real money. Um, you heard what my budget is, under $11 billion. So each year, uh, by not moving people, or assigning them to the same geographic area at no cost, or fleeting officers up to the next uh, tier on the ladder, uh, we avoid over $60 million in PCS cost. Um, and it helps retention. And the retention piece, uh, we enjoy the highest retention right now of any armed service. 40% of our recruits coming out of Cape May, 40% of them will be on active duty 20 years from now. 60% of our officers who are commissioned will be on active duty 20 years from now. And as you know, in our officer community, you know, we have opportunities for election, uh, selection, you fail promotion, you know, the up or out thing. So very high retention rates. I might also add very high recruiting rates from the other services who wish to join the Coast Guard. So we're open for business. If, if you want to hang up your, your, your other military uniform and wear this one, come see me afterwards. Nicely done, sir. Uh, just uh, one last question and we'll open it up. But uh, folding back on you know, law, rule of law, law of the sea uh, comes to mind. And Senators uh, Murkowski, and King recently reintroduced some legislation to ratify the, the Law of the Sea Treaty. And uh, you know, here's this treaty that we were seminal, we, we were the push behind this treaty. We've, we've obviously meticulously adhered to it over all these decades since 82 and 94 respectively, and yet we're not a signature. And in that respect, 
we're in the company of North Korea, Libya, Syria, as uh, the standout countries that have not signed up. Can you talk a little bit about how that being the case, the fact that we're not signed up, we never ratified it, um, affects the Coast Guard's ability to do its mission? Yeah, Pete, that's a, that's a great question. That's a timely one. Uh, the reason I say it's timely is that the uh, Coast Guard, uh, one of our icebreakers, the Healy, uh, has followed UN protocols in mapping our extended continental shelf up in the Arctic. Uh, and so this area is about the size of the state of Texas, beyond our traditional 200-mile limit. Um, and what's below this water on the seabed and below the floor uh, is 13 percent of the world's oil reserves, about a third of the world's gas reserves, and about a trillion dollars worth of rare earth metals. And technology will get to the point where it will be economically feasible to harvest all three of those. Now, the reason I say it's timely uh, is because the snow dragon, or otherwise known as the Shui Long, uh, is on her way up to the Arctic from China. Uh, and they routinely stop and do research in our extended continental shelf. Uh, they've established a pattern there. So if and when we ratify the law of the sea convention, uh, I would expect those who have ratified will protest and say, well, that's part of the global commons. And we, China, have always operated there. Uh, also, Russia has claimed most of the Arctic Ocean, all the way up to the North Pole, um, as a signatory of the Law of the Sea Convention um, and has filed this claim. Uh, and obviously, we've seen what's happened in the East South China Sea. Uh, even though the UN Tribunal found in favor of the Philippines, it has not altered the behavior of China uh, in the East South China Sea. So it's one thing if you ratify and it's one thing if you have a ruling in your favor, but what you have is a piece of paper at the end of the day. Uh, if you don't have the means to enforce this aspect of the law, uh, then what you really have is nothing more than a paper dragon to counter a snow dragon. So I'll just leave you with that thought. So do we need to ratify? You know, I, I cannot state you know, more profoundly you know, the fact that we are not in the best of company of the non-ratifiers, and it's time for us to join the club and ratify the Law of the Seat Convention. Yes, I think it's important to have a seat at the table, too, to be on the inside of that process. As you say, if people can go out, I think it's 600 miles for the extended shelf for the, uh, right. the bottom rights. It's a pretty big deal. So I will open it up uh, to questions from the audience and uh, take this gentleman right here to start. Good morning, Admiral. Uh, from uh, Jim Olson from the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. You talked uh, about the counter-narcotics mission. Um, looking into the future, what do you need the most? What does the Coast Guard need the most go going ahead? Do you need more cyber intelligence? Do you need more ISR capability? Do you need more big data analytics to really figure out where to put ships and boats and planes? or? What do you see in the future would help you the most in that, in that effort? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Jim. And so uh, the fact that, you know, working across the entire enterprise, and this is just not Coast Guard, um, in terms of our domain awareness and, you know, our intelligence queuing, if you will, uh, as I alluded to earlier, you know, we have uh, good awareness of about 80% of illicit flow uh, whose ultimate destination is here in the United States. Um, it really comes down to a, a matter of resources. So, so last year, uh, a record year for drug removal for the United States Coast Guard. In fact, we remove over three times the amount of cocaine than all of law enforcement. That's federal, state, local combined uh, as, a, you know, as a military service. Don't do it alone. Great support across the interagency to help us target that. But we just didn't have enough planes and we didn't have enough ships to target all these other events. And so it really comes down to a numbers game. And, uh, and right now those numbers are not stacked in our favor. Uh, can the United States get after this alone? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, at the same time, we see record amounts of coca being cultivated uh, in Colombia. In fact, Jim Olson and I were just in Bogota not that long ago. In fact, before that, we were in Quito. Uh, and we have not had the best relationship in the past with Quito, but what's happening in Quito now 
is, is that all of the production of cocaine is now seeping south of the Colombian border, and now Ecuador is dealing with, with high rates of consumption, high rates of violent crime, and now they're looking to the Coast Guard. Can, can we help them offshore to stop some of this movement as well? Uh, and I heard the same from Mexico all the way down to Central and South America. Can we have more Coast Guard? And I said, oh, I'd love to, but I only have this much, and you need that much. So we're helping some of these nations actually develop their Coast Guard to get their platforms out at sea and join us as well. We have a very good trusted relationship with two key nations on either end of this, um, rather prosperous nations. That's Mexico and Colombia. Uh, and how do we work multilaterally with these two countries to help the others who are really besieged by the amount of flow coming in? Um, but the other piece of that is ISR. Today I've got 11 ships chopped to Southcom. It's a pretty big number. Um, but what we don't have now is enough aerial surveillance. So it's a great, you've got all this presence on the water, uh, but now we're lacking in ISR, uh, which is why we're looking at unmanned aerial systems, uh, the endurance they provide, the queuing provide to close some of those gaps for us. Um, but that is, you know, it's really a ship and ISR number that, that really befuddles us right now. Uh, front row there, Megan. Hi, sir. Megan Eckstein with USNI News. I wanted to follow up on the ISR piece. Um, given what you had talked about earlier with your limited budgets, I wondered what the Coast Guard's approach was for um, whether it makes more sense to develop your own ISR platforms that more closely meet your needs versus buying what the Navy's working with or perhaps investing in you know, uh, communications networks to tap into what other folks are doing. So uh, good question. It was, uh, probably about 12 years ago, we thought we would go it alone. Um, and, and we looked at different systems that could operate off a of, off of Coast Guard cutter. Um, and, and, you know, if I was Google and doing R&D work, uh, and I spent a fair amount of time in Silicon Valley, um, and most R&D efforts in Silicon Valley fail. Uh, but those that do succeed do exceedingly well, and Google's got a, obviously a great search engine. Um, but we failed in our first attempt at Omni Air, and then we were punished. This is, well, how dare you fail at this? So then we looked at the Navy's uh, Fire Scout program, um, and then we put it on one of our cutters. Um, but then we saw 20 people come in behind it uh, that, that need to support this on manned. I'd say it's on occupied, but it's certainly not on manned. Uh, when I look at the tail that comes with it, and I said, I don't have enough bed space for you all. So I, I need something that, that's less dense in terms of the support. Um, so right now we're working within the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, our Customs and Border Protection Air and Marine Branch, uh, they operate nine MQ-9s. Uh, a couple of these have the Sea View radar, a very good maritime sensor on it. Um, we've invested in R&D to look at state-of-the-art sensors that, that can do all source exploitation, put it in the maritime environment, and then put it in the air for, for 18, 20, 24 hours and maybe not based here in the United States, but based closer to where the threats are at. We have a forward operating base down in Comalapa in El Salvador. We've done flights out of Curacao in the past. So looking at where are the threats, but where can we provide persistent surveillance. But working within the Department of Homeland Security, as a military service, uh, we bring our relationship with DOD in terms of best sensors available. Um, the Minotaur program, uh, which is being operated in DOD, is being operated in the Coast Guard, which has now been adopted by CBP as well. So, so if you can leverage you know, those systems, economies of scale, the training, uh, the spare parts, and all of that, uh, I think there's a, a huge advantage in doing that. So, uh, so that's where we're at right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this gentleman right here in the front row. Yeah. Hi, Admiral. Cal Biesecker, Defense Daily. Um, you mentioned the Chinese making their way up to the Arctic, and you have a mission need statement for three medium icebreakers and three heavy icebreakers. National Academies of Sciences recently said you should probably go for a cost-effective route for heavy icebreakers. Um, and I'm hearing now that you're looking more like at six heavy icebreakers. So I'd like to see how, know how your thinking is evolving related to the icebreakers, and if, it's, if it is going six, why six heavy? Yeah. Um, as you know, you know and uh, what I liked in the analytics by the uh, National Academy of Sciences, uh, so we're looking at three heavy, three medium icebreakers. 
Um, and in all likelihood, if, if you build three heavy icebreakers um, and you say, program done, now we're going to build a medium icebreaker. Well, in all likelihood, any lead ship um, is going to cost more than its successors. And in all likelihood, that, that first medium will cost more than a fourth heavy icebreaker. So that's how they came up with the four heavies. And oh, by the way, you still have the Healy, one medium in inventory. So you end up with five. Uh, now, our rationale behind six, and this was validated by a high latitude study, um, and, and you can use a Navy model. Um, you know, if you need one of anything, you know, permanently present in a given region, uh, you probably have one in an overhaul, and you have one in a workup, and one on scene. So it takes three to make one, and maybe it's 2.8, but we round off and say roughly it takes three to make one, um, and that's how you end up with a, a, a net number of six. Um, can you do it with six heavies? Um, absolutely. I mean, it gives you many more options than three mediums. Our one medium icebreaker, Healy, last year, I had to medevac a crew member, and it took him 36 hours to break free of ice to then get that one crew member in the helicopter range. Uh, it is not ice free up there, even though ice retreats. Uh, the Healy was, you know, two thirds of the way up to the, the North Pole. Um, but there is heavy ice conditions, the wind shifts, pressure ridges. Uh, a heavy icebreaker would have been able to, you know, make it out of there within, you know, probably eight, ten hours. Okay. We're not there yet. Uh, obviously, I, I've got to get that first one fully funded. Uh, I need that first one in the water by 2023. Uh, and there's a lively debate. It's great we've got an integrated program office stood up with the Navy. There's $150 million in the Navy shipbuilding account. Um, but that $150 million buys you about 20% of an icebreaker. I need to get this first one fully funded. Um, and then we look at doing a block buy to build out this fleet. Uh, beyond one, recognizing a lead ship. Uh, I brought with me at a hearing last week uh, a piece of steel. It's about two inches thick, about the size of a brick. It weighs about 20 pounds. That's the density of steel on a heavy icebreaker, and you have to bend it. Um, so our shipyards have not been building ships of this design in 40 years. So there's a front-end investment that industry has to make. Um, but I have to demonstrate to industry uh, that this is a worthwhile investment, not to build one ship, to build a fleet of ships, um, and certainly a fleet of heavy icebreakers. But I've got to get that first one in the water by 2023, because the one it will replace is living on borrowed time right now, and that's the, uh, the Polar Star. Okay, this gentleman right over here. Uh, I'm John Wortman with the American Association of Geographers. Uh, we had a bit of a kerfuffle here in Washington last week, Admiral, with the president's tweets on the transgender policy. You talked about the stability within your own workforce. Uh, how would any policy change uh, transpire with the Coast Guard? And do you have any comments about that announcement? Yeah. So uh, I reached out immediately to uh, now my former secretary. Uh, John Kelly, uh, who also reached out to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, we've stood up a Tiger team of, of our JAG officers, um, but actually that was the second thing I did. The first thing we did is we reached out to all 13 members of the Coast Guard uh, who have come out under a policy uh, who declare themselves transgender. I reached out personally to Lieutenant Taylor Miller, who was featured on the cover of the Washington Post last week. Uh, now, if you read that story, Taylor's family has disowned her. Her family is the United States Coast Guard. And, and I told Taylor, I will not turn my back. We have made an investment in you, and you have made an investment in the Coast Guard, and I will not break faith. Uh, and so that is the commitment to our people right now. Very small numbers, but all of them are doing meaningful Coast Guard work today. Great. Over here, uh, Sydney. Thanks. Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. To follow up on the icebreaker question, uh, the figure I think that's against the first one in the budget is about $1 billion in nice round figures. And when you talk to like, you know, the Danes, for example, which I did a while back, they sort of look at that figure and scoff saying, there's, how could, and you know one but the Americans could spend a billion dollars on a heavy icebreaker. They think, you know, the, the Nordic nations think that's ridiculously expensive. Now, of course, their solution may be to sell you one. 
which may or not be possible, but how do you control that billion dollar cost, or is in fact every penny of that necessary? So, uh, always good to see you. Uh, I don't think you missed one CSIS event, so I think you ought to get uh, you know, emeritus awards here. For there's, a, there's a campaign ribbon associated okay, okay, with that. Okay, okay, absolutely. Um, we're already doing those trade-offs, um, and, and I am very confident we will drive the initial acquisition cost of this platform south of a billion dollars. Uh, the real costs are, are the, what it takes to stand up this capability in the first place. Uh, five shipyards uh, have been awarded industry studies. Uh, in fact, I would say they are ahead of the uh, power curve in, in doing uh, modeled ICE trials, looking at parent craft designs um, and where you might even be able to make trade-offs within those parent craft designs to meet requirements, but recognizing affordability is, is built into this as well. Uh, now make no mistake, this will be built in the United States with U.S. parts. Um, you know, and, and that is, you know, that signal has been sent loud and clear uh, to every service chief in terms of what expectations are for military acquisitions going forward. Okay, um, in the center here, this young woman here. Hi, Hope Suck with Military.com. Uh, so the Navy is in the hunt for its own frigate design right now. Uh, a possibility that has been mentioned at least is looking to the Coast Guard to inform that design. I was wondering if there are any inter-service conversations taking place around that at this point and what you see as the feasibility of a move like that. Where's our Huntington Ingalls rep here? He would probably say, absolutely. I've seen the model you know, at Sea Air Space and other venues where you take our national security design, um, you put vertical launch, vertical launch capabilities, but we haven't had formal dialogues in that. But, um, but it's probably worth a sea story. Um, the sea story is the uh, Coast Guard Cutter Hamilton, you know, named after the father of the Coast Guard. So, when I was at the International Sea Power Symposium, you know, they hosted the reception as they're getting ready to go out on their maiden voyage. Um, and so everyone says, wow, look at this big white Coast Guard ship. This is awesome. Um, well, on their way south, uh, Hurricane Matthew devastates Haiti. So Hamilton diverts. And they take their acting president, our ambassador. They do a bunch of medevacs. And so they're the first on scene. Storm passes clear, they're in the Straits of Florida, they pick up hundreds of Cuban migrants now trying to you know, enter the United States. Um, they pass through there, they go through the Panama Canal, and then over the course of the next three months, they, they, they confiscate nearly a uh, billion dollars worth of cocaine, 13 major drug interdictions. Now that is a, a career's worth um, on her maiden voyage. And then she comes back, offloads this billion dollars worth of cocaine, and literally, the value of that removal is about one and a half times what we paid for the ship in the first place. A ship that will be in service 30, 40 years from now. So I would say that's a pretty good return on investment. Um, and th there were no hiccups. There, there, we didn't have to tow her back in. I mean, it was a great maiden voyage uh, for the Coast Guard Cutter Hamilton. So that's what these new ships are doing today. Um, but clearly, they're, they're operating at the lower end. You would have to totally re-weaponize these platforms uh, to operate at the higher spectrum of naval warfare, and that can certainly be done. Many of the systems on there right now are Navy-type, Navy-owned. Um, it's one of these national security cutters that is the flagship for a surface action group during the Rim of the Pacific exercise. So we're used to operating in the, you know, interoperability with, uh, with the Navy as well. So uh, it is a platform. If nothing else, give them credit and count it towards a 355-ship Navy. Okay, uh, way in the back there, that. Hi, um, Melissa Moses. I'm actually a Marine Reservist part-time, um, but I do work for SCNA. Back in 2014, there was the Ebola outbreak <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and in 2015, uh, John, uh, General uh, Kelly stated that one of his biggest fears um, or concerns for U.S. defense was the migrant um, surge coming up. How do you view the Coast Guard's role in interdicting infectious diseases, pandemic control, um, coming from a, a maritime um, threat such as Ebola or 
um, refugees coming from uh, other countries? Uh, good question. We're not seeing the big numbers. In fact, this year uh, will probably be a record low number for uh, illegal migration. Now, what, what happened? Uh, well, the first thing that happened was the prior administration repealed the wet foot, dry foot policy. And, and so the illegal flow of Cuban migrants has nearly come to an end. Um, at the same time, when we do apprehend migrants at sea, uh, we do an expedited removal. By that, they're immediately returned to their country of origin. Uh, and they'll go to great lengths to try to better their lives, uh, but they need to do so through proper channels um, and not attempt to enter illegally. Uh, very rarely, and I've had command of ships where we had eight, 900 migrants on my flight deck at a given time, one giving birth. Um, our immediate concern is tuberculosis, um, but we have not encountered any infectious disease uh, as far as individuals coming here. I think the biggest threat um, is probably people coming through the air corridors. Um, what happened uh, with the Ebola scare several years ago, we had a nurse on a cruise ship that had been exposed to the uh, pathogen in a hospital in Texas. Um, there was concern that she may have been infected. The ship was getting ready to pull into Belize. Um, and the president of Belize uh, refused the ship to make port there. They were going to go to Cancun. The president of Mexico said it can't make port calls here either. So the ship's on its way back. Um, and then I received an order for the, uh, you know, put the nurse on one of our small boats, 60 miles at sea, bring her in, uh, then we'll draw the blood, and then we'll determine whether she was infectious or not. Um, now that's maybe good advice if you've never been to sea. Now first thing that happens, you get in a small boat, you go to sea, you get seasick. And if you get seasick, you must have Ebola. Um, and so instead, we flew a helicopter out there. Um, we drew blood, but we met with the port authorities in Galveston. We alerted the governor. Uh, we alerted the community and said, you know, what conditions do we have to satisfy before the ship can return to its port where it departed Galveston? They said, well, if you can get this blood work up to Austin and get it back, and if it's not infectious, then the ship, which is what we did. But we let the locals dictate the terms of what needs to happen, but very rare occasions where we see highly infectious diseases on people that take to the water, because I think just the conditions alone are so debilitating, uh, that's not their primary vector, if you will, if they're trying to come into this country. Thank you. Okay, uh, about this gentleman right here, right up front. Thank you. Hello, my name is Russell Kim. I'm with uh, General Atomics Aeronautical Systems. I wanted to ask you, um, what type of activities does the U.S. Coast Guard conduct to build uh, capacity of partner Coast Guards or border forces with a maritime mission? Yeah. Um, so right now we're doing a lot of work with. Uh, a number of countries. Uh, I have a very close working relationship with Japan Coast Guard. They're providing patrol boats for Vietnam and the Philippines. Uh, so they're providing a platform if I will provide the competencies. So we have training teams in Vietnam and the Philippines uh, to give them the competencies to operate in that maritime environment. So if you look at this game of chess, if you will, Japan. Vietnam, the Philippines. Philippines and Vietnam, two ASEAN countries, perhaps the more vocal of the ASEAN nations in terms of encroachment on their EEZ by China. Um, so we're working with those countries. Uh, in Central America, we'll, we'll deliver two patrol boats to uh, Costa Rica uh, and help build out their capabilities as well. Uh, that they have the ways and the means uh, to better police their waters. And they have good judicial systems in place as well. What they lack is the interdiction capability as well. Uh, and then I was just down in uh, Mexico and Colombia working with my naval counterparts in terms of how can we work multilaterally together, sharing information, leveraging resources, um, and, and where we can best apply those to, uh, to a satisfactory end. But those are just several examples of where we're helping build capacity, building relationships um, with a, you know, not doing exercises, but actually doing operations on a regular basis. I think we have time for just one more, one last question. That's, uh, this gentleman over here on this side of the room. Uh, 
Okay, uh, thank you, Admiral. Are there missions that have been urged on the Coast Guard to which you have said that that's really not for us, or that's not the best use of our resources? And second, which country has the world's second best Coast Guard? <laughs> well, I'm given e extreme latitude, and, and some people say, well, maybe the Coast Guard should, you know, change home ports and ship to the Department of Defense. Uh, so when we more than double uh, the number of ships that we have supporting Admiral Tidd right now in Southcom, um, there, there's no, I, I don't have OSD to, over, you know, breathing down my neck. Uh, I don't have to get all these mother may eyes to, to move forces from one theater to the next. Um, I answer to 22 committees right now. Uh, I don't get rudder commands in terms of how do I engage them. Um, and so I get to know them on an upfront personal basis. But when I look at the priorities right now within the Department of Defense, um, when you look at Russia, China, North Korea, violent extremism, Iran, you know, the big five, if you will, um, very little of those resonate with the Coast Guard. Uh, when you look at the dark cloud that sits over North Korea right now, we've got some diplomatic, some economic trade space for a very limited amount of time um, before Kim Jong-un has the capability to strike with multiple ICBMs, the United States of America. Um, I am not in the ICBM, uh, the theater ballistic missile defense world. So if I was in Department of Defense, I would probably find myself being a donor. Um, so I think we're a good fit within the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the missions that we have taken on, you know, some I put at risk um, based on what intelligence that we have. So it's not just intelligence informs you where you operate, but just as importantly, where, where can you go at risk? Uh, because like spreading peanut butter across a slice of bread, you need to stack it in this case in some places and spread it thin in others. So I've been given the latitude to be able to do just that. Um, but I would not single out any one country. Uh, I will say the countries of the many that we interact with, uh, over 160 in a given year, uh, is where you will find Coast Guard uh, in, in different elements. And certainly their biggest challenge is their economics. Now what's important about that, because as I started this discussion, you know, we were a bankrupt nation back in 1790, and we created this thing called the Coast Guard. Uh, what does not get a lot of airtime right now is our nation's debt. Um, and it was a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen, who said the greatest threat to our nation's security is our nation's debt. Um, so if, if GDP growth remains the same, interest rates remain the same, to service our nation's debt in 2026, uh, you're talking about a, just to service that debt, you know, a, a non-discretionary expenditure of over $830 billion a year, where we're trying to get a DOD budget north of 600 and lift budget caps, but eventually we're gonna have to pay the piper or something is going to have to change. Um, and so as I look at the Royal Navy, uh, and if history is a lesson, look where the Royal Navy was in the, you know, in the 1800s and before that. They were a maritime hegemon. Where's the Royal Navy today? Where is our Navy today? But where are we gonna be 50 years from now? Uh, and are we gonna find ourselves in a Thucydides trap or are we gonna have to cooperate with, with other rising powers around us? That is the dilemma that we find ourselves in right now. Um, but what I don't see is an absence of will um, by the other nations that we work with. What I do see is, is an absence of means to carry out their strategies. Well, Admiral, thank you. We know your time is uh, precious. We've enjoyed this chance to have this discussion. And uh, on behalf of CSIS and the Naval Institute, we thank you. And we also thank our sponsors, Lockheed Martin and Huntington Ingalls Industries uh, for making this possible. But sir, your time, very valuable. And again, thank you. Oh, thank you, Pete. Thank you.